Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's um, Cardiff Japanese online lecture series, um, which is supported by the Japan Foundation London. And as ever, we give our thanks to them for their support of the, these uh, webinars. Um, today, we'll be hearing about Seasons of the Soul, Waka Poetry and the Shaping of Japanese Culture um, with the speaker, Do Dr. Thomas McCauley. Um, the lecture will be around about 40 minutes long or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for question and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box. Please don't bother raising hand or using the chat feature. We don't won't be using these. Put them in the Q&A and so on, and we will um, read those questions out um, when we get to that stage. Um, the webinar, as you probably already know, you probably had the notification, is being recorded, and you can see it on YouTube in due course. So let me introduce um, today's speaker. Um, as I said, our speaker is Dr. Thomas McCauley, who's a senior lecturer in Japanese studies at the University of Sheffield and an expert on pre-modern Japanese poetry and culture. Among his publications in the complete translation and commentary of Ropyakubun Uta Awase, that's a lot easier to read if it was in kanji, too much romantic going on there. One of the most significant poetic and critical texts of the period, an experienced translator, he regularly posts new translations of pre-modern Japanese poetry on his website, www.wakapoetry.net, and also on a variety of social media channels, um, Twitter, threads, at least, I think I'm, I'm following Tom on. Um, among his current projects are studies of pre-modern critics' attitudes to the inclusion of Chinese influence material in Waka poetry and the impact of poets' gender on their compositional practice. So over to you, please, Tom. Right, okay. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Chris. Um, I'm delighted to be here to speak about, about um, classical Japanese poetry or waka. Um, and so with no um, further delays, I will get started because I've got a lot to say. And Chris has told me he'll cut me off if I keep on, if I go on for too long. So, Seasons of the Soul, Waka Poetry and the Shaping of Japanese Culture. I thought I would start with, um, as the, we have the word seasons in the title of the uh, presentation, some statements about Japanese, Japan's climate and seasons in, in, in general. So Japan has generally mild weather. Japan has gentle snowfall in winter. Spring has gradually warming temperatures characterized by sequences of blossom. Autumn has gradually cooling temperatures characterized by colorful autumn leaves. Summer is warm and humid, and clement weather has meant the Japanese largely live in harmony with nature. Now, if you said these various statements to an average Japanese person on the street, I expect most of them will probably nod and say, yes, that's that's a pretty good description of what weather is like in Japan. I have to say that, though that I didn't come up with these statements myself, they're basically a paraphrase of the opening paragraph of a Japanese high school geography textbook. So they're what is taught to Japanese high school students about the nature of the weather and climate of their own home country at school. Um, but as Haruo Shirane points out in his excellent book, Japan and the Culture of the Four Seasons, they're all myths. Absolutely none of them are true. OK, so if we actually want to think about what Japan is actually like in climatological and meteorological terms, then this is more um, a closer account of the picture. Japan has some of the heaviest snowfall in the world. The city of Sapporo in Hokkaido has a higher average snowfall than any other major city on Earth. Its annual rainfall is equivalent to many tropical countries. Um, spring and autumn, in fact, are tr transitional periods between cold, severe winters and punishingly hot summers. And people have frequently struggled to coexist with and survive nature in Japan. So what is the reason for this disconnect between the cultural educational view of what Japan's climate and seasons are like and the actual physical reality on the ground? Well, if you actually look at it, then this traditional view of nature, which is espoused through education and textbooks and so on, in fact, describes the seasons in nature as it was in Kyoto, the capital of Japan, in the 400 years between 800 and 1200 or so. 
It describes the seasons of nature as experienced by the Japanese aristocracy. And thus it describes the seasons of nature as depicted in Waka poetry. So it is because of the influence and the long-standing influence of Waka poetry on what one could might call the Japanese cultural imagination, that this view of what Japan is like has actually been propagated and is so powerful. Now, you might be skeptical. Think, how can poetry have such an influence on an entire culture's conception of what itself and what its own physical world is like? So let's look at an example. Here is a, a single poem um, from Kokinshu, the first imperial poetry anthology, which is also in another um, um, work, Ise Monogatari. Once he was traveling to the Eastlands with one or two friends. On reaching a place called Yatsuhashi, eight bridges in the province of Mikawa, they saw there were irises, kakitsubata, blooming particularly beautifully by the river. Dismounting and resting in the shade of a tree, he composed this poem, expressing the feelings of someone homesick with the correct syllable of kakitsubata at the beginning of each line. Karakoro mo kitsutsu nare nishi tsumashi areba harubaru kinuru pabiyoshizo mo. A cafe robe have I worn so often I know it as I do my wife. Having come so far, this journey rests heavy on my thoughts. And you may be wondering why the um, transcription has ha as opposed to ba in the fourth line. Well, that's because when the poem was written, um, the syllables ha and ba were written identically, so they essentially look the same. Now, this poem was written by a poet by the name of Ariwara no Narihira in the middle of the ninth century. And it was enormously eventual, influential and very famous. How was it influential and very famous? Well. It became the basis for artworks depicting the sea. You can see here a folding screen depicting the irises and the bridges of Yatsuhashi. It is, it, even today, the source of sweets, which you can buy in many shops in Kyoto or elsewhere in Japan, designed to look like the bridges and to be piled up like this. You can even, if you go on Japanese Amazon, buy Yatsuhashi-shaped chopstick rests as well. And if you go to Yatsuhashi, the town itself, and look at the manhole covers, they have this very poem inscribed upon them. You will also find Yatsuhashi-inspired lacquerware. And if you go to parks and gardens throughout Japan, you will find the scene itself recreated uh, physically for people to enjoy and remember. And this is just one poem. And there are literally thousands of um, waka surviving which have been remembered and have influenced Japanese culture since they were composed. So this is just a small indication of the significance of waka poetry for Japanese culture and Japan's conception of itself in a whole range of different ways. But let's then take a step back and actually think about where waka began, how it was composed, where it was composed, who composed it and so forth. So it's context of production in many ways. Well, it was composed generally in the city of Heian-kyo, the, what is now Kyoto, the capital of Japan between 794 and 1868. If you go on Google Earth, for example, and take a look at an aerial view of Kyoto and the modern city, you will still be able to see, see signs of this grid pattern in the streets of the city. So the ancient city still exists in some physical form if you go to modern Kyoto today. It was composed by the aristocracy, and the aristoc aristocrats of Heian Kyo lived in buildings much like this. This is an indication of a typical aristocratic mansion. It had a main building, um, which you can see marked with the number one in the picture here, facing out into a graveled area and looking out on the garden, which always featured a pleasure lake as well. It's not a particularly good picture, but I hope you can see that the buildings all had verandas um, around them and aristocratic life existed very much in this sort of liminal space between the inner um, buildings, the inner shapes of, shapes of the rooms, and the outer spaces as well. People would come and sit on the verandas and drink and talk, play music, compose poetry as well, and just admire the natural scene. So this is the physical environment in which the people who lived actually composed the poetry. But who are they and what do they compose poetry for? Well, it was composed for a whole range of different sorts of reasons and for a whole loads of different ways. But it was an everyday activity. Everyone composed poetry pretty much all the time. Um, it was a standard means of polite interaction. 
So if you wanted to inquire about a, fr a friend's health, you wrote a letter with a poem inquiring about it. If you um, heard that someone's child, or mother or wife or father or son had died, you wrote a poem to express your condolences. Um, it was a standard means of emotional expression. If you were unhappy about something, you wrote a poem about it. And you could even write poems to your boss as a way of asking for a promotion, you know, a better economic situation as well. And it was a key form of communication in romantic relationships. Um, if you wanted to approach someone romantically, you generally did it through poetry, and I'll give you some examples about this. Um, Waka therefore functioned for the aristocrat aristocrats of Heian Kyo very much in the same way in which instant messaging, social media posts and other things function in the modern 21st century. Just as modern relationships between I would say young people, because they're not, not young anymore, are often initiated and conducted through the exchange of WhatsApp messages, text messages, social media posts, and so forth. So too uh, were Waka for the aristocrats of Heankyo. Let's take a look at a sort of example of what I mean by this. Say you are a young lady um, of a middle-ranking noble household, sitting at home one day in your house with your mother um, and ladies in waiting around you, when something which looks very like the thing um, you can see in the picture on the slide here arrives delivered by a messenger. Carefully wrapped up piece of paper attached to a blossom, a sprig of cherry blossom. It's a letter, it's a love letter. It's a love letter from a very senior and high ranking noble. And inside it is a poem. Your song to simply hear is so sad, O cuckoo. An exchange of words is my heart's desire. So using the image of the cuckoo, Kanaie, who is the son of the regent and thus one of the more powerful um, young men at court, has written to the lady in question, saying, I've heard rumours about how accomplished and lovely you are. I would like to actually get to know you better. I would like to be able to exchange words with you directly. I'd like to be able to talk to you. So I'm interested in initiating a romantic relationship with you. Now, getting a, a letter from one of the most important young men at court is not something which can be ignored, even though you might want to. And so the young lady in question was eventually prodded by her mother into sending a reply. But she didn't write it herself, of course. No, 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 no. She got one of her ladies in writing, to waiting to jot down the following reply. To exchange with this, they're not a soul at this estate, oh cuckoo. So pointlessly, don't trill your song. Very cleverly, the lady in question, who we only know today as Michitsuna's mother, has picked up on the image of the cuckoo in, in Kanae's um, original poem. Now, one of the cultural ideas about the cuckoo was that it was very promiscuous and therefore faithless. So she's saying to him, you're trifling with my affections. I can't trust that you'll actually be faithful to me. You're not serious about me. OK, it's a pose of a lady's resistance to a man's um, advances, which was the correct and socially appropriate thing for a woman to do in these kinds of circumstances. Kanae, however, is not discouraged. And the two of them continue to exchange poems for months, essentially. Um, eventually, the lady deigns to reply to him in her own hand, and eventually he comes to visit her at her house. And eventually, her diary simply says, and then there was one morning when he was there as well, meaning that he'd spent the night, the relationship had been consummated, and their marriage essentially had begun. So this relationship is formed and run entirely through the exchange of poetry indicating how important it was as a vehicle for communication between aristocrats in Heian Kyo. Let's take a look at another example. Say you are um, a woman serving at the imperial court. You've been got a position there, which is very um, uh, privileged for someone in your social class and position. You wake up in your chamber one morning and you can hear outside your chamber the voice of Fujiwara no Michinaga, who is the regent, father of the empress, and thus the most powerful man at court. And he's giving orders to um, servants to clear the garden and do various things. Noticing that the shutters of your chamber are open, he wanders over, picks a maiden flower, peers in, and passes it to you. 
Now, do you reply to him? No, you don't reply out loud. What you do is you go over to your inkstone, you write down the following poem. This maiden flower's vibrant hues I see, and that the dew makes no difference to me, how well I know it. Now, this is a somewhat flirtatious but also ambiguous poem. It could simply be saying, you've given me a maiden flower in the morning, it looks lovely because it's got the morning dew on it. I don't look at my best in the morning because um, I've only just woken up, my hair's a mess and so forth, and so I'm embarrassed that you've seen me. Equally, however, the dew could be a metaphor for Michinaga's romantic advances. You've been trifling with my affection, she says. Um, you know, I know you're not serious about me as a romantic partner. Michinaga smiles in reply and responds. Shiratsu yu wa wakite mo wakaji o minayashi. Kokoro kara ni ya yuro no somuramu. Silver dewdrops fall where they will, so surely it is the maiden flower's own heart that stains her with such hues. So he's suggesting, if you're worried about my lack of attention to you, don't be. It's your feelings which are causing these problems. It's not something that I'm doing. So poetry could be used for these kinds of bantering, flirtatious exchanges. Let's look at one more example from Murasaki and Michinaga as well. Murasaki has got her position at court because she is the author of Japan's greatest modern novel, The Tale of Genji. And uh, it was read, a court was read by the Empress. So a little later in her diary, she recalls that she's actually sitting with the Empress herself. They've been reading the tale of Genji when Michinaga comes into the tale, into the room and makes what she says is a number of stupid jokes about it. Now, stupid in that context probably means off colour, but it's a little ambiguous. After making the jokes, he comes over to the two of them, picks up a brush, and writes on a piece of paper which is displaying some plums for the Empress to eat the following poem. Saucy is what folk say, so at the sight there's no man would not pass by and pick one up, of that I'm sure. Now this is a poem um, built around an expression of wordplay which is sukimono. Sukimono could be a, a tart and sour thing like a piece of fruit, but it also meant someone who was very interested in sex and erotic matters. So what he's saying to Murasaki is, you have a reputation as something of a prude, but you've written this really racy and sexy tale, you know, which is, which is the real you. Now, Murasaki is quite shocked that he's being so crude, particularly in his daughter's presence, but she has to reply. So what does she reply? She replies with a poem. No man has yet to pick one. So who is it that might have a sour but saucy taste within his mouth? So she's saying, you haven't had me, so you've got no idea which way, which way I am either. Um, so it was used, for, poetry was used for these kinds of bantering exchanges between men and women at court as well. But it wasn't only used for romantic matters. And it wasn't only... Um, a casual social matter as well. It had very high status, poetry itself and waka in general. Okay, it was composed and recited for official occasions. In the early ninth century, the Japanese court adopted a number of um, ceremonies and rituals from the Chinese court, where the emperor would set poetic topics for his ministers to compose, and their composing poems in Chinese at his order indicated. Um, imperial authority and provided a ritual support to the imperial institution. After the beginning of the 10th century, Chinese poetic composition began to fall out of uh, favour to some extent, and Waka took this over. And so we begin to see the commissioning of anthologies of um, Waka poetry by emperors, and this continued throughout the period from 915 to about 1439. Um, it was therefore an essential accomplishment for anyone who wished to be cultured and anyone who wished to survive in aristocratic society, in aristocratic society. And it became eventually a means of philosophical, aesthetic and religious inquiry of and expression. So a way of penetrating into the deeper secrets of the world. Here's the um, list of books which formed the contents of the Kokin Wakashu, the Collection of Japanese Poetry, Ancient and Modern, which is the very first imperial anthology. As you can see, it has 20 books, but is dominated by two main topics, the seasons at the beginning of the first half and love at the beginning of the second half. And these 
two topics dominated Waka poetry composition throughout history, I think one can really say. Um, and given this high importance that was attached to Waka and being able to produce Waka and its usages, then it became a significant means of economic and social support for lower ranking nobles who were actually good at poetry. By being good at poetry, you could get invited to be tutors to these kinds of the upper nobility. You could get invited to um, in poetry events where you could rub shoulders with members of the senior nobility and therefore make connections with people who could provide economic and social support or political support to you and your family and, and um, colleagues. Um, Poetry was used as a proxy for demonstrations of political authority by senior nobles and emperors. One can almost track the ups and downs and the vicissitudes of Heian period political authority by seeing who it is is sponsoring and producing major poetry works at any particular point in time. Um, given this high level of importance, then this led to disagreements developing over the poetics of Waka poetry itself. We get disagreements between poets over the meanings of diction, the meanings of individual poetic words, what they mean in a poetic context. We get disagreements over the interpretations of earlier poems. Um, by the time we get up to the 15th, 16th century, then you've got hundreds of years worth of poems to look at. And some of them were really very remote in terms of language and imagery from the present day. Um, we get disagreements over acceptability of usage, you know, how particular ideas and images should be expressed in poetry. We get disagreements over the sources of novelty, how to produce something which sounded new and fresh um, in a tradition which was essentially highly conservative. And from the mid 12th century, we get the development of rival poetic houses and schools in order to preserve Waka knowledge, to pass it down to their descendants and disciples, and essentially act as focuses for critical disagreements, which also reflected economic, social and political disagreements among the court nobility. By the time we move into the medieval period, after the imperial court and the court nobility lost political control of the country and the samurai came to um, dominate Japan, then the waka aesthetic essentially dominated high culture then too. There was nothing else which could actually function as a source of high culture at that time. So waka essentially served as the source and origin for things like nor theatre. Um, it formed as a... a um, source for images in art, it for, became the source of images for uh, material objects as well. Samurai rulers who were keen to show their cultural credentials often sought waka instruction. They recruited nobles or poets who were able to teach them poetry so they could compose poetry themselves. And eventually waka itself gave rise to other poetic forms. In about the 14th century, we get a form developing called linked verse, Renga. And finally, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, this morphed into a form of verse or called poku, um, which transforms into the modern haiku. So even the modern haiku essentially has its origins in waka poetry. Waka themselves began to be valued as art objects for their material features as well by this time. So let's take a look at this. Here's a poem from Shinshoku Senshu, um, a later imperial anthology, composed by Sayonji Kintsune in the, around the beginning of the 13th century, composed on Fallen Blossom. Hana soso arashi no niwa no yuki nara de furiyuku mono wa wagami nari keri. The blossom beckons me to my storm wet garden, where tis not snow that's fallen and grown old, but my sorry self, alas. But this poem itself, the written text, which you can see in the image here, is actually written by Emperor Goyose around the beginning of the 17th century. Now, Goyose is renowned for the skill of his calligraphy, and you can see how he's chosen a beautiful piece of paper with a design on it, and in some ways blended the shape of his characters into the shape of the design. But how is this actually um, displayed and valued as an artwork? Well, if we look at the full picture there, you can see that the poem slip itself has been mounted on a hanging scroll and is therefore used as a piece of art um, for appreciation in important people's households. And this is how many waka were displayed. So waka themselves morphed from simply textual objects into material objects, which could be the object of veneration 
and appreciation for their physical and material characteristics too. But where did Waka come from? Well, they didn't obviously spring into existence suddenly at the beginning of the Heian period in the late um, 8th century. Poetry was being composed in Japan earlier on, as early as the 5th century in some ways. And we know this because there is an earlier anthology called the Manyoshu, which translates as the collection of a myriad leaves or possibly the collection of a myriad rains as well. And this is Japan's oldest poetry anthology. It contains a wider range of poetry and poetic forms than the imperial anthologies do, um, but a significant um, source of information about manual period, cultural language and imageries. You can see from the slide that it contains 4,536 waka poems in Japanese, Chinese poems and passages of Chinese poems. It's organized into 20 books and it's probably because of this manual organization into 20 books that later imperial anthologies were then organized into 20 books. Um, and it covers the period from the mid fifth century all the way through to 759, which is the date of composition of the last dateable poem in it. Um, we see in modern Japan today that these poems are still popular and are still remembered and often used as monuments in various kinds of ways. You can see here a picture of a rock um, which has a manual, po manual poem inscribed in it, um, and which is used as um, a marker in, this is in a particular park. I took this picture myself. And in fact, if you understand, know Japanese, you can do searching for these kind of manual poetry. Um, rocks and there are blogs by people who go around the country taking pictures of all the different manual poems on different kinds of rocks and stones all over the country. So manual shu is remembered by modern Japan in many kinds of ways. Um, it contains a range of different types of poetry um, that, which are generally classified as banka, elegies, suomonka, poems expressing feelings, miscellaneous poems, and then long poems and short poems in different types of forms. But one of the key features of manual poetry is this is a use of botanical imagery and references. So there are approximately 160 plants mentioned in approximately 1,500 of the poems in the anthology. Um, so we get botanical imagery and botanical poetics as a key feature of what the manual show is about. The poems refer to the plants in terms of their appearance and appreciate how beautiful they are. It refers to poems which are used as foodstuffs, um, sorry, plants which are used as foodstuffs and for manufacture. And it also refers to plants in various kinds of ways for punning and dual meanings. Let's look at a few examples of this kind of manual usage of botanical imagery. So here is a love poem, one of two poems sent by Otomo Sukune Yakamochi to the elder maiden of Sakuno Ue. Wasure gusa wagashi stahimo ni tsuketare do shiko ni shikobusa. A forgetful daylily to my underbelt is bound, and yet this annoying weed is so in name alone. Now, you can see a picture of the daylily itself on this slide here, but the reason um, Yakamochi is using it in this poem is simply because Wasure Gusa, the Japanese name for the plant, contains the element Wasure, which means to be forgetful. So it's a way of introducing that particular image into his poem and conveying it to the elder maiden of Sakuna Ue, who is his wife. Um, so it's being used for wordplay rather than for any actual features of the plant itself. On the other hand, we do get poems which refer to physical features of the plants. So here's another one. Akane sasu hi wa tarasedo nuba tama no yo wa tarutsuki no kakuraku oshimo. Glowing matter red, the sun shines on, yet black as leopard flower seeds. The night traversing moon's concealment is what I regret. Now this in fact, return, which can, poem contains a reference to two different plants, the akane, um, which I haven't put a picture on because the reason it's used is because if you grind its roots up, you can make a red dye out of them. So that's why the translation is glowing matter red. Um, and the nubatama, the leopard flower. And I've got a picture of those on the screen. And as you can see, they are indeed glossy black. So it was used to bring that image of blackness into the poem. So it's because of that physical feature of the plant that it's being used in the poetry. Okay, here's another example of it. Um, a poem by the Governor General of Dazai, Lord Otomo. 
立花の花散る里のこととぎす、かたこいしつつ、なくひしぞおき。Orange blossom scatters round my estate, where the cuckoo for unrequited love does cry on many a day. Well, Tachibana, the orange blossom here, is being used as a symbol of the season of summer. The plant itself and the orange blossom is, is associated with summer, and it's linking that with the bird, the cuckoo itself.、Um, so you can see there's a range of different ways in which、um, botanics, plant names, were used in manual poetry. And this use of、um, botanics, plants, and so forth. In manual poetry, is something which is remembered by the modern Japanese today in various ways, in particular through the large number of manual botanical gardens, manual shokubutsuen, which you can find throughout the country.、Um, and here you can see a picture of the first and largest manual botanical garden, which is actually in Kasuga Shrine at Nara. I hope you can see that there are displays of plants.、Um, Little plaques which give information about the plants themselves, and then other plaques which give information,、um, give sample poems referring to those plants. So you can see the plants and the poems displayed for the enlightenment and entertainment of tourists and visitors to the garden. Now, these、um, manual botanical gardens are quite an interesting phenomena in the way in which the ancient, ancient Japanese culture and expressions. Are linked with modern tourism and the way in which people go about enjoying and experience parts and regions of Japan. So, some quick facts about them. There are 37 different gardens located throughout Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu, so the three main Japanese islands.、Um, the only one island which doesn't have a manual botanical garden is, sub, is Hokkaido, up in the far north of Japan. Of the 37 gardens, 27 are open to the public. And the oldest is, as I've just said, at Kasuga Grand Shrine,、um, opened in 1932. There's a wide range of different types of designs from formal gardens to wilderness trails. And they have various different kinds of functions. You have standalone institutions, so a、uh, place which you visit and you simply go, and it's the manual botanical garden,、um, which is what you go to see. You have gardens attached to religious institutions, both, both Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines.、Um, you have them attached to museums. You have them attached to educational institutions, universities, and high schools, and those ones are generally not open to the public. You have some private manual gardens, which are generally accessible by、um, special arrangement, and you have some manual features, which are part of larger parks or botanical gardens.、Um, You have some on the list which are, have been relatively very well maintained, and you have some which have more or less fallen completely into disrepair, or indeed started off with、um, very big ideas about how they would reflect Manyoshu, and these ideas never panned out due to lack of funding. And so you only have sort of traces and elements of manual elements、um, left for talk to them. But let's give you some examples of different types of manual botanical gardens. So on the outskirts of Tokyo, We have Ichikawa Municipal Manual Botanical Garden, which was opened in 1989. Now, the reason why the city of Ichikawa decided to establish a manual botanical garden within its、uh, environs was because five manual, manual poems were composed in the vicinity, and they wanted to provide a physical link as well as a green space for、um, residents and visitors to actually enjoy and think about those links with the Um, ancient culture of Japan. It's 3,387、um, square meters, so it's a reasonable sized、um, botanical garden,、um, but you can walk around it in、uh, 10 or 15 minutes if you, if you want to go quickly.、Um, it contains 197 different types of plant, who told me very proudly when I visited. So, 67 grasses, four bamboos, 82 trees, 15 different types of vine, 22 freshwater plants, six seaweeds, and one fungus. Um, so, in fact, it contains a wider range of plants than actually in the manual shoe itself. As you can see from the pictures which I've got here, it's laid out very much as a traditional Japanese garden.、Um, I generally go there when I visit it early in the morning. It's usually just me and maybe one or two other visitors and the gardeners themselves tidying things up and improving it.、Um, it's a short train ride from the center of Tokyo and is well worth a little visit if you want to go and see it. So, this is an example of.、Um, 
Manual Botanical Garden as a standalone institution, which is supported by a local municipality for touristic and um, cultural reasons. Now, by contrast, we also have the Kokobunji Manual Botanical Garden, which covers the grounds of Musashi no Kokobunji Temple, um, so I've spelt that spelled that wrong in the slide. There it should be it's not Kokobuji, but Kokobunji Temple, which is um, again a short distance outside of Tokyo, not too far, in fact, from the Ghibli Museum. Um, so you could take in both in one day if you're looking for a um, visit to two different, completely different types of attractions um, from different periods in Japanese history. Now, this was garden was opened in 1963, but was in fact the private project of the head priest um, Hoshino Ryosho at the time. When he took over as head priest, and this is back in the 1950s, he discovered from wandering around the gardens of his temple that in fact 62 of the plants mentioned in the Manyoshu were already growing on the grounds. And he decided to convert the grounds of the temple into um, a manual botanical garden by collecting all of the other manual plants and planting them in the temple grounds, which he did between um, 1950 and 1963. And the garden was then opened in 1963. He had the support, he was lucky because at the time, a number of senior manual scholars lived in this in the in Kokobunji and supported him and were able to help him with the endeavor. Um, and the garden is now um, maintained by his son, um, who is the current head priest. So this is an example of a temple manual botanical garden. As you can see, it's somewhat overgrown when I visited, but we have again, plants lifting the plants which they're displaying along with poems um, associated with them. So a very different type of experience going to visit it. Um, as a local um, popular Buddhist temple, Kokobunji is always busy with um, pilgrims, visitors of various kinds going to pray and so forth. So it's not a quiet oasis to appreciate nature so much. Um, there's a nice area sitting um, to the side, and it's not shown in the picture, where the local old people come and sit in the sunshine and chatter away. So you have conversations going on, people coming around, people praying and various other, other kinds of things going on. So it's a very different type of environment. Um, as a final example, we have Futagami Mountain Park Manual Botanical Garden. Now, this was opened in 1968 and is not too far from the city of Takaoka. Now, Takaoka is located in Toyama Prefecture, um, which was a part of Japan where the one of the major compilers of Manual Shu, Otomo no Yakamochi, was actually posted as a provincial governor. Um, so one of the ways in which Takaoka attempts to attract tourism to itself is to badge it itself as the manual city, the city of the Manyoshu. Its tram line is even called the manual line. So you get on the trams in the city and they're covered with manual imagery and manual poems. There's a large manual resource center and museum and out of the city, um, up in the mountains, then there is this um, manual botanical garden, which is difficult to get to unless you drive or hike for several hours um, and is essentially a little bit of a wilderness trail. It contains only 39 manual plants um, and as you can see is somewhat overgrown and you have these rather imposing concrete plaques there which gives information about the um, plants and then some poetry as well. And these were written by a senior um, manual scholar from the local area as well. And the reason it was put so far away from the city is because um, it was located in an area that Otaimo no Yakamochi is believed to have loved, although no one actually really knows for sure. So we can see there's a whole range of different types of ways in which Manyoshu Shu is still alive and experienced by the people of Japan today. Manyoshu Shu is perhaps the poetry collection which is most loved and remembered by people in Japan today because it's the way is the one which is most likely to be experienced in this physical form by people who live in local areas um, through these kinds of um, monumental um, uses of manual poetry through the construction of tourist facilities as well. So it's an indication of how intertwined um, ancient poetry is with modern Japan in very many ways. And as Chris mentioned, I do have a large number of different social media um, ways which you can find me. So I have my poetry website, wakapoetry.net. You can follow me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on threads. Uh, you can find me on TikTok. And there is even a Waka Poetry YouTube channel. So if you are interested in getting some poetry on a daily or weekly basis, 
please do feel free to access those. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, um, Tom. Um, so I'd like to invite um, participants. If you have any questions, please start dropping them um, into the Q&A section now. Um, I'm going to take Chair's privilege to ask a question, if I may. Um, actually, two questions, but linked together. And sort of going back to the early part of the presentation where you were talking about this mismatch between how Japanese seasons are presented and the reality of what they can be like. Do you think there was anything within the Waka poetry itself to try and shape how Japanese people should view seasons and nature rather than them being necessarily reflecting the reality and tied to that to a degree? Is there anything in any of the Waka poetry which could tell us anything about how some Japanese people may view respond to climate change? I mean, that's that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, one of the features of Waka poetry as it developed was that um, essentially you have judgments about what makes it what makes a good poem, and it, one of the key criteria for what was considered to be a um, good poem was that it should be realistic. But realistic didn't mean that it depicted the real world. It meant that it should be depict the world as it was conventionally depicted in other Waka, po waka poems. So you get a sort of a self-reinforcing circle because you had a whole range of cultural association of, of associated descriptions with particular seasons, imagery, and, and so forth, which are um, associated with particular seasons. Those are what the poets wrote about and how they expressed the seasons and the emotions in, with them. And therefore, that simply snowballs into how the seasons should be perceived in that kind of way. Um, I mean, the question about responses to climate change is an interesting one. Um, I think that the jury is still out on it to some extent, but in talking to people who run um, the manual botanical gardens, the actual garden stuff as well, um, one of the sort of common threads which sometimes came up with those is that some of the plants are dying out because of climate change. And so you won't get the plants which um, were referred to in manual truth because the climate no longer support, supports them, um, which is an issue of concern to them, but also then an issue of cultural concern. Um, I think that rather than sort of walk up, I say, given that um, the poetic form, which is more generally you know, sort of composed um, these days eh, by the average Jap Japanese, generally, it would be the haiku itself. And, but haiku, of course, derives from waka. There is certainly concern that haiku will have to change or because um, many of the plants which are mentioned and associated with particular seasons, the kigo, the seasonal words, no longer reflect what the seasons are like as a result of, key, of climate change. So. Um, Certainly, pre-modern haiku with their or haku with their depictions of how the seasons are are becoming less linked to what Japan is like now, and that is a concern for purists um, uh, uh, in terms of it's going to result in a, a radical change to what, um, how haiku might be expressed. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, we've had one question already come in um, from Nozomi Abe. Um, are there any particular Waka translators you like? If yes, could you tell us why? Are there any ones who I like? Um, other than myself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. Well, um, I mean, as a... And, and, I mean, I guess expand yeah. this out to Waka poets as well, probably, yeah, rather than just yeah. translators. Um, who do I admire? I mean, I, I admire um, Laurel... Rod. Laurel Rod has done complete translations of both the Kokinshu and the Shin Kokinshu, so the first and eighth uh, major imperial anthologies. Um, I admire Laurel as a translator because 
she had the discipline to produce English translations, which are all in the exact form of the original poems. So five, seven, five, seven, seven syllables, um, you know, which is an, an astonishing achievement and something which is not something which I follow in my own practice, but I admire it certainly as um, a, a compositional practice. Um, as someone who produces accessible um, translations for non-specialists, then Peter Macmillan, who has translated the Ogura Hyakunin Ishu um, and a number of other um, poetic works is someone whose poetry is certainly well worth reading, I would say. Um, obviously, there, there are other translators, um, Royal Tyler, um, for example, um, who has produced a complete translation of the tale of Genji and associated poems as well. Um, he, uh, in conjunction with Joshua Mosto, who's from the University of British Columbia, produced a translation of Ise Monogatari, which contains the poems as well, but with an interesting commentary about how the poems are, have been viewed since and what they actually mean. So that's well worth a read, and I, admire, I like um, um, Royal's translations. And then finally, there's also Edwin Cranston, um, who was professor of Japanese literature at Harvard. Um, he produced a couple of mammoth waka anthologies of poetry, the Manyoshu, and then later. Um, and his poetry translations are always entertaining and very well written as well. So. Thank you for that. Um, I've got another question. I mean, the, you obviously picked out a few examples of parts and so on. Um, one of the things that struck me about those is that they're relatively recent creations, given the history of Waka. What, what is the reason for this? And I mean, I assume there are some old, I mean, some of the part, parts could be older or hidden away or whatever, the less open ones, but why the sort of more, creation, more re recent creations of parts? I mean, I think the... Um... The reasons why there are more recent, the manual botanical gardens, essentially, is because the reasons for their creation vary between personal projects um, by, by individuals, by the desire um, to produce something or um, produce um, um, air, um, facilities which were accessible to the everyday, everyday people. Um, and that was something which only came into was of interest to the rulers of Japan, you know, once we enter the modern period. Um, it's also motivated by the most recent ones by desire on the part of municipalities, essentially to generate tourism to their own areas for various different kinds of reasons. So if they're looking around for um, something which they, to hook um, a tourist facility on, and they have a manual link, then it's a good thing, good thing to be able to do because it's something which everyone will recognize and uh, you're guaranteed to get, well, at least the elderly turning up. And if the elderly bring their grandchildren, then that's a sort of steady stream of people coming along. Um, in terms of older facilities, yes, there are certainly links between gardens um, and waka poetry um, in various kinds of ways. Perhaps one of the most famous um, gardens, traditional gardens in Tokyo is called the Rikugien, um, which uh, was originally the private garden for a daimyo. So it wasn't open to the public. It was built purely for the daimyo's personal um, pleasure. But there are very, very strong links with waka poetry for that, in that some of the prospects and artificial landscapes which were created in that garden were created because they... Um, duplicated landscapes which were written uh, which were written about and described in waka poetry so by going to actually he could sit there and look at this uh, artificial island and think i'm looking at the coast in such and such a place which is referred to in these poetry poems um, and there are a number of older gardens um from the Edo period, essentially, which survive, which um, have that kind of poetic link. But those were not designed originally to be open to the public. They were designed as private pleasure spaces for the upper aristocracy, essentially. Related to what, how you answer that, thanks for that. You mentioned about sort of the elderly particularly being interested. So a follow-up question is, when and how do people 
in Japan generally get exposed to wako poetry? Is it through the education system, just through the experience of traveling around? But don't answer that question yet, because it's, it actually ties into a question we've had in the uh, chat as well from uh, Alejandra Escamilla Sanchez, who says, your talk was fascinating. I never considered how useful poems were for nobility at the time. I think it would be interesting if people communicated like that at the moment. Do you still think um, people use um, WACA nowadays? Perhaps in Valentine's Day, we can see them being used again. Thank you for your time. Well, um, I think it's relatively rare that people would use um, WACA in that way in these days as, as, as in right now, because it's more likely to be a serious cultural pursuit. Um, but with that being said, um, I remember back when I was a student chatting to um, one of my um, Japanese language teachers, and she was talking about her grandmother's experience on her wedding night. So this is at the beginning of the 20th century, it would have been. Now, the marriage itself was a, an arranged marriage. She had uh, hardly exchanged two words with her husband before they were actually married. Um, and so she's obviously extremely nervous. She's taken into the bridal chamber at the night. Her husband, new husband, is sitting there, um, formally kneeling with the futon beside him. But in front of him is an inkstone, a brush and a piece of paper. And he pushes it towards her and says, compose me a love poem. So her very first experience in married life was desperately trying to cobble together a love poem um, to start off their relationship. Now, at the time we were having this particular conversation, um, there had been just been a marriage in the imperial family uh, happening at that particular point. And my teacher was sort of speculating, I wonder if the new lady who was married into the imperial family and become a princess, whether that was her first experience too, because one can imagine that's the sort of thing the imperial family would still do. But so it's only, only that, um, I think. But in terms of the images and, and the way in which you know, young Japanese people would express affection and love in, in various kinds of ways. Well, Valentine's Day, I suspect they would probably use hearts and flowers like, uh, which are derived from the Western tradition generally, rather than something derived from Waka um, itself. But if you wanted to go on a romantic date in summer, where would you go? So in spring, where would you go? Well, you would go to view the cherry blossoms. And why are you going to view the cherry blossoms? Because cherry blossoms are the standard trope for spring in Waka poetry. And so there's that kind of influence. Um, you asked earlier then about where people encounter Waka for the first time. Well, yes, generally they will encounter it through the educational system. Um, it's something that everyone would learn at school to, to a certain extent um, and would be expected, I'm sure, to compose at least some poems with their teachers looking over their shoulders and so forth. But um, there is also uh, an enduringly popular um, New, Year, New Year game called Karuta, um, which is played by many Japanese families as part of being together in um, at New Year. Now, Karuta involves um, one person reading out the beginning of a poem, and in front of two, the two other people who are playing are cards laid out which have the other half of the poem um, inscribed on them. And the person who wins is the person who recognises the most and grabs the most cards. Um, essentially. Now, so that collection, which is used for Karuta cards, which is called Oguro Hyakunin Ishu, is without any doubt the Waka poetry collection, which is best known and memorised by people from a whole range of um, walks of life, because it's part of it. And Karuta itself is a, as a game is ingrained into Japanese popular culture in many ways. There's a very, very well-known popular culture franchise, I could almost describe it as, called Chiha Yaburu, which is about a young girl who wants to become the Karuta champion of Japan. Started off as a manga, you have anime, you have other kinds of features as, of it as well. I'm sure that you could even find in some places um, Chiha Yaburu, um, pachinko machines somewhere in Japan as well. So there's those kinds of connections, um, which is how young people generally experience it.
Wonderful, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, the Karuta one I'd forgotten about, and uh, I'm aware from overhearing conversations between students sometimes how even Karuta even gets into manga and anime and so on as well. Um, but uh, another question from uh, Abe Sensei asking, what would you recommend us to read or do before going to a manual park? Which season would be good for a visit? Um, well, I, I suppose the answer to that is really it depends what sort, sort of weather you want to go around the park in. <laughs> so um, if you want good, nice, clement weather, then I would go in early spring or mid to late autumn. If you go in early spring, then you will have cherry blossoms or plum blossoms. If you go in late autumn, then you will, of course, have autumn leaves. Um, if you go in slightly later, later in spring, in late April or May, then you will have the beautiful wisteria blossoms, um, which you'll also be able to see. Um, in summer, of course, it will be very hot, um, but you'll be able to see new grown rice um, coming up. You'll be able to see orange blossom and some of the other plants too. Um, so it really depends, I think, upon your um, stamina um, and what it is you actually want to look at. But of course, as, as I said, there's a wide range of different sorts of manual parks and you'll get very different sorts of experiences by, by going to them. A couple of the um, standalone manual facilities, in particular the one in Hamamatsu, for example, actually has a manual festival and so recreates um, different kinds of events um, at particular points in the year. So you can go in and have that kind of added experience. Um, you can even go into their cafe and order a peasant's manual meal or an aristocrat's manual meal if you want to. So you can actually get a taste of um, narrow period cuisine if you, if you wanted to get that too. So there are different types of experiences. Um, I mean, if you are interested in going, then I want to get an impression of what the poem the plants and poems you actually like then well not to blow my own trumpet but i've got a page on my website on manual um, plants take a look at that that lists all the plants um, i've also got poems from virtually all of them translated as well so you can see the kinds of usages there so that will give you a, a grounding in what they're actually actually like so thank you for that um we've got a, another question from uh, janet wademan saying thank you for a fascinating presentation are there any internationally recognized counterparts in other languages and cultures? Um, the answer to that is I'm, cer I'm certain that there are. Tanka are widely composed in English as well. There is a, an American Tanka Society. There is a British Tanka Society too. But I'm a Japan expert. I'm a pre-modern Japan expert. So I don't tend to read um, Tanka, which originally composed in other languages. So I'm afraid I don't know uh, of anyone in particular. Okay, and I believe uh, Nishikawa Sensei, you also have a question. Yes, um, I used to teach Japanese um, secondary school students and then taught um, Manyoshu and Kokin Wakashu and so on, and asked them to um, compose Tanka Waka, and they had great difficulty. But I understand back in Manyoshu era, uh, ordinary people were able to make some. Do you think the education at the time was, um, how can I say, I, I found it difficult because there was no formal education at the time. How were they able to make such, do you think? I think the answer to that is, is, is sort of twofold. I mean, we do see poems which are written in Manyoshu as being um, written by people of lower social classes than the upper aristocracy. We certainly do see those uh, poems by the border guards um, and various other kinds of um, poems. Um, the likelihood is, I, I think the consensus among manual scholars is though that those have been improved by um, the compilers for aristocratic audiences when they were being put together. So we don't actually really know what they mm. were, what they, what they were they, they were originally like. Um, but equally, when we look at what the kind of topics those people are writing about, um, we see poems which are really very, very human and expressing very human emotions. So poems by the border guards is, is essentially um, conveying emotions. You know, I'm, I'm 
a long way from home. I'm in the ball on the border in such and such a place. I miss my wife. Yes. Uh, I might die here. I might never see her again. So those are very, very human emotions. And you don't need um, a great knowledge of technique or diction mm -hmm. in order to be able to express those emotions. And so that's one of the reasons why manual poetry is, is very direct in, 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 that, in that kind of way. And we do, obviously we do see poems which are very carefully crafted by the aristocracy, but um, you know, we equally see those very sort of open and direct kinds of words, uh, poems as well. I mean, it's certainly the case that we do know that literacy was relatively high mm -hmm. in, um, among people other than the aristocracy in pre-modern Japan. Um, I mean, I remember reading oh, a number of years ago that when they were redoing the um, main building of the Tordaiji Temple um, and checking it, and they're up in the attic and, and looking at the at the rafters, they actually found some poems inscribed on one of the rafters, which had been written by one of the carpenters who was putting it together or repairing it um, in the Heian period. So obviously carpenters were able to write waka and wanted to leave their little message to say that they could uh, um, had been there at, at that particular time. So, um, again, simply because it was, I think, so much a part of everyday life as well. I mean, it's, it's very easy, I think, to write a poem if you're sitting in a place and actually looking out of it. You just write about what you see. So for people who are actually going to poetic locations and seeing things, then it's much easier. It's obviously much more difficult for us as at that kind of remove um, to think of how to put those into um, into words, and obviously for you know, um, given the, the the weight of the waka and tanka tradition these days, um, it's not surprising that young people are very intimidated <laughs> if they have to write tanka in class. Definitely, um, but it's certainly the case that you know, some young people do and do it very very well, as you know. I mean, we have the um, annual New Year Poetry Meet, help, sponsored by the Imperial Family, the Utakai Hajime. Um, and for that, then people from all over Japan compose poems as the sort of public part of the, of the, of, of the event. Um, and I remember looking at the broadcast of, was it last year's one? And the very first poem which was read out was by a junior high school girl. So she had written something which was considered to be good enough to be recited in front of the emperor. So, you know, some of them could definitely do it and will do it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I know we've still got at least one more question to come in, but I'm afraid time is against us. But I'm sure Tom would be very happy for people to reach out by email or social media um, to find out more about his work. So, again, thank you very much, Um for all the wonderful presentation and answering all the um, different um, questions that people had. Um, if I can just quickly share this slide. So um, this uh, presentation will be available as a um, recording in due course um, via the Cardiff Japanese online lecture series on YouTube. Um, thank you again, everybody for attending. Um, you will get a short survey after the um, webinar. It'd be much appreciated if you could fill that in. And our next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 28th of February, um, where we will have Jotaro Arimori um, speaking on male speech, female speech, rethinking gendered expressions in Japanese. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And thank you again, Tom. Thank you very much.